Thank you so much for coming to my talk. Uh, what an interesting world we live in right now. Even with the pandemic going on, we have this virtual space together and attend the conference in our pajamas. I love it. And thank you, Sally, Matt, and Lawrence for inviting me to talk at AVAR. I first gave this talk at Game Sound Con last year, and I'm very thrilled to present this here again at AVAR. This talk, Minecraft Through a New Lens, Recontextualizing Audio for Mobile AR, will be essentially about my experience while working on a mobile AR game, Minecraft Earth. Before we dig into the talk, let me give you a brief, in brief introduction about myself. My name is Shani Jang. I'm currently an audio designer at Microsoft Mixed Reality team. I joined this team a month ago, and I work with three other awesome audio designers to design and implement soundscape for various mixed reality projects. Minecraft Earth team was my previous team where I made all the new audio assets, including sound effects and music, and incorporated original Minecraft sounds and mixed them together to design the soundscape for Minecraft Earth. I'm a composer and a sound designer. I was previously at Nintendo Software Technology in Redmond, Washington. I made some music, music arrangements and sound effects for several game projects, including Super Mario Maker for 3DS and Sniper Clips, uh, Sniper Clips Plus. I'm a graduate from DigiPen Institute of Technology, which is the real version of this virtual space that AVAR is held right now. I immigrated from Daegu, South Korea. So if my English is a little bad, that's because I'm nervous. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, along with my work at Microsoft, I also work with Audio Kinetic for localizing their documentation, certifications, and blogs into Korean. So what will we talk about? Before that, I wanted to ask, how many, uh, how many of you played Minecraft? Can you send me some emojis if you did? Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, I just gave my mic. Okay. <laughs> nice. Uh, if you ever played Minecraft, send me an emoji. Oh, you already did that? Okay. <laughs> Great. I'm glad that most of you are not total stranger to the game. Please let me know if you don't understand any Minecraft terms that I'm using right now. So we're going to talk about three things. First, designing with intention, the high-level considerations. In this topic, we'll go over what major points I had to consider and keep in mind to de design soundscape for this game. Before I design anything, I need to understand how the game is structured, what the focuses are, and what the challenges are. Secondly, uh, unique solution for unique problems. Here with the things I discussed in the first point in mind, I'll go over what unique challenges we had for this game and how we came up with the solutions. Third, the lessons I learned, literally. Before I get into the details, I should tell you that this talk is not really a technical talk for AR. It doesn't focus on one aspect uh, of the audio either but this is more like a summary of my thought processes to go over some main design points, challenges I had, and solutions I came up with. I'm not giving any answers or rules for designing mobile AR audio either. What I hope is that you see what my process was like, provide some interesting things to talk about, and if there are any better ways, you can give me suggestions or you can apply those ideas for your future AR projects. So, but first, what is Minecraft Earth? Uh, let me play you a trailer. Sometimes life requires thinking outside the blocks. No pets allowed in the house? Fill the backyard with muddy pigs. Host the perfect pixel party. Handcraft some compact cuteness. Or build something a bit more heavy metal. Minecraft Earth is at your fingertips. And above your head. And right behind you. Just watch out for surprise chicken showers. Sometimes things don't quite go as planned. Luckily, Minecraft Earth lets you tell your own stories. 
You can even upscale an epic fish fail. So grab your friends and explore an unbelievable world. Our own. Discover new dimensions to your creativity with Minecraft Earth. As you see, Minecraft Earth is an augmented reality game for mobile devices. It brings Minecraft into our universe. You can play both on iOS and Android. We're currently in early access, so things are still changing a lot um, and adding, being added a lot, but you'll be able to download the game right now and play around anytime you want. Uh, a little more in depth, we have four game modes. The first one is location-based exploration and resource collection with tappables. This is the part, um, this is a part that is kind of similar to other mobile AR games like Pokemon Go and Harry Potter Wizard and Uni Wizard Unite. As you explore, you'll see a different type of tappables. As you can guess from its name, you tap on tappables to collect resources. Each tappable reveals different items when it's broken open, and the ones with the rarer items inside will require more taps to break them open. But why do you need all these resources? Well, of course, to build, just like Minecraft, right? In Minecraft Earth, you use build plates. A build plate is like a living chunk of Minecraft in a Lego size. You'll be getting more exciting build plates as you level up. Any flat surface is an opportunity to build. Just load a build plate, place a mob or a block that you place a mob or a block that you collected, or you can mine blocks that are provided with the build plate. Since this is a living, breathing Minecraft world, the water flows, crops grow, and fire spreads. You can also build with friends you invite. Once you're happy with your creation, you can place it in the real world, in a life size. We call that play mode. In the play mode, you can go inside the building you created, interact with doors and buttons, and play with mobs or kill them if you want. Since this is a separate instance, everything you do in this session will be reset after you exit the mode. You can also invite your friends to play together here too. But that is not everything. There is an adventure mode. Adventure are place, uh, adventures are placed in specific places in the real world, just like tappables. When you're close enough, you can enter to play the adventure. In adventure, there will be some puzzles to solve, mobs to kill, and there are a lot of, uh, a lot of ores and rarer items you won't, use, you won't usually get in tappables. When you complete the adventure, you'll get a reward too. This is like a very guided version of Minecraft with a clearer emotional arc and goal. So now that we know what the game is about, let's discuss some main points I had to consider before designing the soundscape and what questions I had in mind. So there, oops, sorry. There are three main points to consider. Let's think about the social and open gameplay aspects first. You can explore, build, or go on adventures alone or together. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm a little, uh, where am I? Here, okay. <laughs> Let's think about the social and open gameplay aspects first. Uh, sorry, I'm in a different place. Sorry about that. No worries, Shani. Um, 
Uh, so uh, we're seeing, Sorry. or at least I'm seeing. There we go. Yeah. So it looks like you just were able to advance slice. I think you're okay. Okay. There is that. Yeah, three main considerations. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, there you go. And second, it is a mobile AR game. And third, this is a Minecraft, but in the real world. It is a franchise expansion. I had to think about how to modernize and scale the Minecraft aesthetic. And let's think about the social and open gameplay aspects first. Um, you can explore, build, or go on adventures alone or together. This is a multiplayer game in real life. So you'll hear your friends talking and the sounds from your friends' phones, if they have their speakers on, of course. The gameplay is very repetitive and it cycles very fast. You can walk miles and miles just collecting tappables. You walk, you find tappables, and you get items, and you, you repeat that for a long time. You'll hear those tappables and item reveal sounds a lot, and those sounds should be a rewarding sounding, but not annoying. As I said, you can walk, you can walk miles and miles just to collect tappables, and you can also spend hours and hours just building. Playtime can be very long. So what does that mean for music and sound? Well, I think the first thing to keep in mind is don't do annoying. I know that a lot of people mute their speakers when, the, when they play mobile games, but if they do have their speakers on, what do they want to hear? What do they care about and what do they not care about? I need to keep the soundscape to be not only ambient and relaxing, but also informative to the players, so they want to keep hearing them. And one thing I keep in mind is that no one plays a game muted when they, when they play it for the first time. Even when they have their speakers muted later, they're imagining the sound effects and music that they remember in their head. So sounds are indeed important for mobile games too. Now let's talk about the mobile AR aspect. Does AR always mean cutting edge technology for audio? Should I consider using HRTF? In case you don't know what HRTF is, HRTF is head-related transfer function. It is how our ears perceive sounds in space. Well, first of all, the game is not really best experienced with headphones. This is not a wearing headphones is highly suggested kind of game. High, te high technology spatial audio is not the focus. Like I said in the first point, this game has a very strong social aspect. You want, to, you want to talk to your friends and hear your surroundings while you're playing the game. Also, oh, okay, I'm a little ahead. Also, we have some platform and technical limitations. The memory and CPU limit is not, re not really high on mobile devices. Um, also, because it is on mobile, players will most likely play with earbuds or with the phone speaker. Even though the sound the sound quality of those have improved a lot. We still have some limitations for the frequency range that it can use. And of course, because this is AR, not VR, we need to incorporate the real life sounds. And because this is a real life multiplayer mobile AR game, we had to deal with other player sounds as well. We don't have to worry about playing their sounds because it is already being emitted from their actual position. So it's like we get the free spatialization. So what sounds should we still hear on your speaker? And what sounds do I not have to play on from your speaker? And not only that, a very unique aspect of Minecraft Earth is that we deal with different scales of AR gameplay. We have a tabletop size build play, just like having virtual Lego blocks to build with. And we have the full size gameplay where you go into the world that you built or go on adventures to mine ores and get rewards. Another consideration I had in mind was modernizing and scaling the Minecraft aesthetic. 
This game is still a Minecraft game, but there are a lot of new things added to it. Visually, the lighting is better, particle effects are cooler, and the animations are way more detailed and polished. There are a lot of variations for each animations too. So what does this mean sonically? What does it mean for sound effects? And how about the music? What things can I make better and newer? And what things should I keep the same? Also, this is a franchise expansion. So I needed to think about how I can sonically brand Minecraft franchise and Minecraft Earth. An example I had in mind was Nintendo Switch. As you all know, their UI sounds are so well designed and it represents the Nintendo Switch brand really well. If Nintendo Switch UI is snappy and mechanical sounding, I wanted Minecraft Earth to sound bloppy and acoustic sounding. Players don't use a mechanical button or mouse, but they use their fingers to tap on the screen. So I thought making the UI button sound bloppy would fit better. Also, I wanted to use more acoustic sounding sounds instead of synthy UI sounds. Also, as much as I wanted to, to go crazy and make it super polished and high res, Minecraft is not really about being realistic. Everything is a block. You can hear zombies in a cave below you, just like they're right next to you. There's no fancy DSP effects either. There are barely occlusion and obstruction happening in the game. We don't really have, we don't even have typical ambience loop like wind, imaginary birds, or crickets in Minecraft. As much as I want the soundscape to be fuller, this is certainly a characteristic of Minecraft and I should respect that. Lastly, I had to create a pipeline that scales with the new project. With the original system, it is going to be really hard to achieve the audio goal we had for this game. I'll talk about this uh, more later. So with these three main considerations in mind, let's talk about the problems and solutions. So the first point is, was about social and open gameplay. Like I said earlier, the gameplay can be very repetitive, happens in fast cycle, and can be really long. So, wow. So really, at all costs, do not be, do not, I, didn't, I didn't want the sounds to be annoying at all to the players, which is really hard to achieve. <laughs> um, so for music, I kept the same style of implementation as original Minecraft by giving a playlist of music instead of looping the same track until the gameplay state changes. And each mode has its own playlist. So the map mode has its own playlist. The build mode playlist is filled with the creative mode tracks from the original Minecraft. And the play mode playlist is filled with the survival mode tracks from the original Minecraft. Between each track, we give a randomized delay in between, so there's some silence between the tracks. For sound effects, I had to pay attention to how often a certain, st certain type of sound effects are played. For example, every time you tap on a tappable, you're rewarded with items. Each item reveal has a celebration sound that is tied to its rarity. Each rarity celebration had to sound unique so the player could associate the sound with the rarity. Since this is a short musical stinger, I simply transposed in whole steps and made five variations for each rarity. There are also some long sounds that are repeated, re repeated as well. In those cases, I keep the same instrumentation but compose a different phrase that is rhythmically or harmonically different. The main focus for these variations was to keep them sound simi similar enough so that the player can learn it and associate it with its purpose, but it is different enough that it is not tiring into their ears. Also, this is multiplay in real life. If you are playing with your friends, you'll probably be hearing the sounds on the speaker, not from your earbuds. This means that the fancy spatial audio won't really make a difference between, uh, because everything will come out of this almost mono phone speaker. Another reason not to worry too much about HRTF or fancy spatialization technology, right? Not only that, you get free spatialization from your friends. Nothing can beat real life spatialization. 
So we take advantage of this and don't play third person's character sounds such as when they take damage or eat because you'll hear it from their position. So because of all this, the master output from my FMORE project is a lie. <laughs> so this is a graph of Minecraft Earth bus structure. So there are many different child buses to handle each type of sound and they all go to the master output of my FMOD project. But that is not really everything. There are a lot of real life sounds being mixed into the game sound before it reaches into your ears. So what are some unique problems and challenges I had specifically for this, this being mobile AR? For this game, we had a unique challenge to set attenuations for 3D sounds. On a macro level, we had different scales of gameplay. There are two main scales. In the play mode and adventures, everything is a full size. You're basically the same size as the characters in Minecraft. However, in the build mode, everything is tiny like Lego blocks. So you're like a giant um, comparing to all the mobs and blocks. So you can see everything that is happening on the surface. Originally, we tried keeping the attenuation the same as normal Minecraft, but there was a problem. The attenuation was set using the blocks as a unit, so if the volume, volume property is 1, it can be heard until you're 6 blocks away. So after 6 blocks, the sound just drastic, drastically cuts up. There was no way that it could fulfill Minecraft Earth's needs with this, so I had to redesign attenuation settings for each object. But even that was not enough. Using the full size attenuation settings for the build mode didn't work because you had to be pretty close to hear the sounds. So I had to create separate settings for the build mode. But even the build place size differs depending on its size as well. A block in a 4x4 build plate is bigger than a block in 3 by 32 by 32 build plate. So the design team and also the design team was still in process adjusting scales and brainstorming different scales when I was designing the attenuation settings, so I needed to keep that in mind as well. So this is what I did. The, uh, the event itself doesn't play any assets directly. The parent event doesn't have any tracks with actual assets. There's no attenuation settings either. Instead, each event has an RTCP, uh, RTPC named scale. When this parameter is set to 10, it triggers a refer reference event called full scale. And when this is set to 20, it triggers a reference event called tabletop. So the reason why I have these empty spaces in between um, is to leave room for any possible scales in between these two major modes. Inside the nested event, you'll see the actual sounds. Uh, this is the nested event for digging grass in full size. One block is about 0.75 meter, so this sound starts attenuating from 2.25 meter. And around 22.5 uh, meter, the sound will be at its maximum attenuation value. And this is the same sound, but it's in a tabletop mode, which is for build mode. In the tabletop mode, one block is about 0 0.07 meter. So about at 0.28 meter, the sound starts attenuating. And around a 4.9 meter, the volume will be at its maximum attenuation value. So this is a difference in a macro level. Tabletop and full size have their own attenuation. But not all the sounds have the same attenuation settings for tabletop and full scale. Just like typical games, some sounds should be heard even when you're far away from it, and some sounds are only audible when you're pretty close to it. Prioritizing sounds was very important for this game because, because of two main reasons. Number one, the build and play mode is um, it's almost like a sandbox game. So for example, you can build a barn with hundreds of animals. There can be so many sounds playing um, happening in this tiny chunk of Minecraft. And number two, you can build for hours and hours. But the variation we have for idle sounds for the mob and ambient sounds were pretty limited. And again, the audio shouldn't be annoying. 
So because of these two reasons, I had to divide the sounds into different categories and prioritize them for better focus and performance. So these are the main set seven categories of sounds in the AR mode. Left is the most important and the, the right side is the least important. Place, uh, player sounds like damage and eat are the most important sounds with no questions. These are played in 2D, nice and loud. And the UI sounds and stingers are equally important. We have a feedback sound when you try to place a block or a mob in an invalid place as well. And we have some music cues to guide the players in adventures. All, all of these sounds shouldn't be compromised in any ways. So I play these sounds loud and clear in 2D. The second tier category is interaction sounds. Um, some examples on these sounds are mining, building, interactable block sounds. Whenever you dig, place, break a block, open a door, or press a button, you hear the sound. And these sounds are very important because these are direct feedback to player's action. So even in the build mode, when everything is a Lego size and you're pretty far away from it, you should still hear these sounds pretty loud and clear. The third tier category is hostile mob sounds. The reason why the hostile mob sounds have higher priority than peaceful mob sounds is because they can harm the players. So they don't only serve as an environmental ambience, but those sounds give players important information. And just like original Minecraft, if there's a skeleton hiding below you, you will want to know, right? So that you don't die. And the fourth tier is peaceful mob sounds. So even among hostile and peaceful mob sounds, hurt and death sounds for both type of mobs are more important than their idle or behavioral sounds because those count as interaction sounds. And the fifth and sixth tiers are ambient sounds. And of course, the functional ambience like piston or fireworks explosion are more prioritized than environmental sounds like water and lava. And one thing to note is that water and lava sounds are actually really important in original Minecraft because that's how you find a cave and expect potential danger when you're digging. But in Minecraft Earth, you can't really fall down into water or lava. So those sounds could have a lower priority in this game. So let's look at two different main type of types of attenuation curves that are used among these type of sounds. This is the atten attenuation curve I use for important sounds like player action feedback and informational sound effects. Since you have to, since you have to hear the sounds pretty clear even when you're far away, I set the minimum distance to be longer. This makes it so that the sound doesn't attenuate until it reaches this value. After a minimum distance, the sound starts attenuating using the curve I, I assign, and when it reaches the max distance value, the volume is maintained. However, for less important sounds such as peaceful mob, idle, footstep sounds, and looping sound effects um, have a s smaller minimum distance, so it starts attenuating at a shorter distance. Instant limit on these are also set more strictly to prevent voice starvation. So I spent a lot of time scribbling notes and drawing things um, on my notepad, but that doesn't really make anything perfect, right? Real-time profiling and tuning was so important to get these things right, so I play tested a lot. And for build mode, I tested as I get further and further away, as, I, as far as I could go to build things. I made sure that the interaction sounds like digging and placing a block uh, attenuates when you get far away, but still audible. And for play mode, full-size mode, I kept things pretty similar to the original Minecraft and the real world except for the fact that the sound doesn't just cut off after six blocks. So another thing I had to deal with considering the AR aspect of the game was the real world sounds. In augmented reality, the real world is the ambience. Unlike virtual reality, we cannot take players away from the real world. Instead, we enhance the real world's ambience by adding an extra layer. So it's like a augmented ambience for augmented reality. 
in the map mode, you're not full. You're not fully in AR mode, where you're where you use the camera to see your surroundings with the augmented gameplay. When you're looking at the map, it has the same geography as real world, kind of like Pokemon Go, but the vibe is totally different. Right now, the map looks like a grassy biome in Minecraft. The sky is blue, it is sunny, and the grass is everywhere. So whenever players explore to collect tappables, I wanted them to feel relaxing and feel like they're just walking on the grassy meadows, even though they're just like in downtown Seattle with lots of trash around. Um, that's why in the map mode, I have a layer of wind and birds as augmented ambience. However, in the AR mode, the chunk of Minecraft is seen on top of your surroundings. It, should, it would feel weird if I put imaginary birds or winds to that, especially if you're playing inside of the building or in a snow and snowy and dark place. Instead, the in-game sounds like mobs, water, and lava coming from the virtual Minecraft world naturally fill in the space to form the ambience. Now let's move on to the last point, scaling and modernizing. So I mentioned earlier that I wanted this game to have a modern Minecraft aesthetic. Um, and again, Minecraft is not really about being realistic. There are no footstep switches to cover different surfaces, no environmental effects either. I had to stay on this non-realistic brand, but deliver a newer experience for Minecrafter. I had to establish a musical style as well. So here's a diagram that shows what things exist in original Minecraft and what I chose to keep and what I'm adding on top of it to make it feel like Minecraft Earth. In the original Minecraft on the left side, the animation sounds are not really synced perfectly to animations. There are no UI sounds for a lot of the buttons. There are only some acoustic click, click type of sounds for some important buttons. The attenuation curves are not really set well. The sounds are hard cut after certain blocks. These had to change. However, I kept the footsteps to be surface agnostic, agnostic, which gave more characteristics to each mob. I also kept the UI to be acoustic sounding to stay within the brand. And on top of that, on the right side, I added some environmental ambience as a layer of augmented ambience. And I synced the animation sounds more, strict, more, more tightly to the animation to keep up with the detailed animations for new mobs. And I created more variations to give mobs more personalities. Also, the UI sounds are more tailored to reflect players' action and feedback. Some simple DS, DSP effects were used to make, sounds, um, make it sound more high-res and modern, and I incorporated more musical sound effects for more emotional guidance. Then what about music? C418's music, um, if you know, it's, he's a composer for Minecraft. Um, his music has been used in Minecraft for a long time. We wanted to keep using some original music so the player in instantly have this nostalgia to the original Minecraft. But we wanted to introduce new music that represents this specific game. Since we are blending both original and the mu new music, my main goal for music was to keep the same style but introducing something new. So let's talk about the main aspect of the Minecraft music for a moment, the original Minecraft music. I don't have a clip ready here, but let's talk about some main characteristics of C418's music. A lot of the tracks use ostinato patterns, mostly using sequencer in a synthesizer. Musically, it doesn't move very fast. Nothing is really in your face and driving your emotions fast. There's a sense of distance and space. And solo piano is used for theme music. And of course, a lot of synth pads. And as you might have heard in the menu scene, which is the theme music, the theme melody is a descending phrase. It, is, it starts at the highest point and it goes down. So it goes like, da 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 da, da 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 da. Like that. <laughs> okay. 
So for Minecraft Earth, I wanted to introduce some new musical aspects that goes well with the new, new gameplay and visual aspect of the game. I wanted to feel more outdoorsy, especially when you're exploring your area and collecting tappables, which is totally, totally a unique part for Minecraft Earth. I wanted them to feel like they're walking in a grassy biome in a sunny day. I also wanted to incorporate more acoustic instruments and acoustic sounding synth pads. This goes in parallel with the visuals having more updated looks. And in contrast to descending theme of the Minecraft, I wanted our theme to be ascending. But as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to keep the playlist style of music with pauses in between. So we're starting with the original music first and we move on to new tracks later. The reason is because these original tracks from the original composer have such strong triggers of nostalgia and familiar familiarity. <laughs> and these really help sealing Minecraft Earth as an absolute Minecraft core game. This was a direct request from the game director. So we start with the nostalgia and introduce a new era as you explore the map. So here's the first two track I wrote. Um, this is a video I put together for our team to sell this, sell this idea initially.
Yay! <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. If I may, um, so I was actually just searching this stuff if to see if somebody just catch the captured the game music and posted on YouTube because people do that. <laughs> and I came across this uh, comment uh, and I really just wanted to share it because it was such a rewarding moment. Uh, let me just read it. Um, I have to say, this song does what it was designed to do. Not all songs successfully evoke the feels they were going for. This song, as, you wa as you're walking around through the real world and moving so slow through the Minecraft world, you think how absolutely huge our world is and how much you have left to explore. It brings to mind just how precious and rare and anomaly uh, our little slice of the universe is, a sphere of life and joy in a sea of darkness and emptiness. That just really warmed my heart. <laughs> so I just wanted to say, share it. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier in this presentation, it is going to be very difficult to achieve the audio goal for this game with the original system for Minecraft. And before I joined the team, there was no audio person. So creating an audio pipeline that scales with Minecraft, Minecraft Earth was my main focus when I first joined the team. Let's talk about the original Minecraft features and tools for a moment. Original Minecraft is built on a custom engine and it uses FMOD low level API. All of the audio files were stored as FSB files, and everything was handled in JSON files and in game codes. And again, there were no functionality to loop or stop the sounds. For, uh, so first of all, I knew that I had to somehow request an audio tool to, build, um, to be built so I have more control, or I had to convince the team to integrate some kind of middleware. Also, since we use the entire vanilla Minecraft gameplay in the AR mode, I needed them to be included in my hierarchy of sounds for Minecraft Earth. So figuring out how the audio works in Minecraft and figuring out the audio pipeline was my first action I had to take. Luckily, they were too busy to build any custom tools for me. <laughs> and luckily, we were already using low-level FMOD API. So I was able to convince the team to integrate FMOD Studio and I imported all the vanilla sound, the original Minecraft sounds, into my project file so everything could be under the same hierarchy of sounds. This was a huge upgrade for us. And since we're doing a lot of detailed animations for mob variants, we absolutely needed an ability to sync animation sounds to the animation. Believe it or not, this was a huge step uh, from uh, original Minecraft, and this really helped me design more detailed animation sounds. Um, and establishing audio team and advocating for audio. I feel like this is a challenge in a lot of teams and companies, especially when you're the only audio person. When I started, I didn't have a project manager for audio, so I kept missing, I kept not being notified immediately about all the important deadlines and major game changes. Also, Tester didn't have any structure to test, your, test audio, so it took too much time to find any audio bugs. Basically, I was the only person who's even noticing that the game was missing the whole sounds one day. That was scary. And at the same time, at that time, they thought audio was just a polished thing they could do if they have time. So I have to keep reminding people that audio is not polished. You know, artists, designers, and programmers all work together to put a feature in the game. And audio should be part of that process, not on top of it after everything's done. So it took a while to establish this with my team. I asked the Art PM project manager to be my PM as well. And right now, missing audio is a blocker for a shipping a build, which is a huge upgrade. And I had a programmer who I worked closely to develop audio pipeline. And because the devs have different levels of experience for implementing audio, I should always be as clear as I can. Assuming how the game engine takes care of audio things and how the dev will implement was very dangerous for me. For example, in Unity or Unreal, when you attach a sound event, sound event to the game object, the p position constantly updated, the position is constantly updated as the object moves. 
that doesn't just automatically happen in our engine. So it is crucial to explain every single detail of where the sound should be attached to, how it should behave, and what things I'm handling in FMOD so they don't assume anything wrong. So what did I learn? Of course, I learned a lot of things, but I wanted to point out some important lessons. When I first figured out that this was an AR game, I freaked out and worried about learning all the fancy technologies to handle the spatial audio. I was Googling like HRTF and AR and just like high tech and I was just going so crazy and scared. But no, you start, oh, can you hear me? If you can hear me, oh yeah, you can hear me, there you go. So when I first figured out that this was an AR game, I freaked out and worried about just learning all the fancy technologies for AR audio. But not really. You start with the end goal. What do you want the player to experience? And what do you want them to feel? What is the main focus and end goal for this game? And after that, you choose and use that technology you need to achieve your goal. Cutting edge technology doesn't always mean the best. What works is the best. I also learned a lot about how to advocate for audio. Especially as the only audio person on the team, it is not easy to explain what you envision. Whenever I wanted a cool audio feature, I made sure to spend a lot of time to make, up, uh, make a good mock-up video, and I shared that with the team instead of just writing a spec. Showing my vision within the context is extreme, extremely helpful to make them feel. Instead of explaining the audio needs with the feature request spec, just show them and make them feel and listen to what you envision and make them fall in love. Then they will want to have your cool idea in the game because they just love it so much. And that is the end of my talk. This game is still actively being developed, and there are a lot of new features being, being added. I highly recommend downloading it and playing around with it, and I can't wait to hear what you think of it. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Hi. Hello? Uh, yeah. M Megan, are you moderating? Uh, yes. Can okay, you... now we can hear you. Oh, yeah. yeah oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Yay. That's right. Okay, yep. Yeah. So, uh, Lawrence, uh, with the first question. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I know I always butt in with questions, but I just love this <laughs> talk. Shani, fabulous presentation. Um, I noticed that you coined a new technical term for sound designers. Bloppy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So <laughs> that will now be in the lexicon, and we'll start teaching that at Japan as a, as a music <laughs> thing. Um, but my question to you was, you, yeah. you, and I loved it, you talked about it a little bit earlier. You, you said audio is, not, audio is not polish, and then uh, you went on to say that, you know, about expanding on your, your um, mission to, to make your, your teammates fall in love with audio. And I just it made me think of a question I asked Emily Ridgway uh, during yesterday's uh, Valve panel discussion. Uh, I don't know, if, mm -hmm. did you, were, did you, were you there for that? It was no, really good. It. Oh, well, anyway, yeah. but she mentioned that she had to champion audio during the simultaneous development of the Valve Index hardware and mm -hmm. the VR game Half-Life Alex. And uh, she just, I mean, the whole ear speaker scene was just her idea. She just, and she championed it. So I asked her about that. I said, why is it that we as audio uh, people have to champion our cause? And it was interesting. Her response was she said that, it was really that she wanted, she just felt that it's our responsibility to do exactly mm -hmm. what you, Shawnee, just said, which is it's, mm -hmm. that's our job, is to, is, to, is to share our music and sound and our vision with our, our, our coworkers and to make mm -hmm. them fall in love. And I love your, uh, your, your, your explanation of that. But that was basically what she said, too. And I just, yes. I thought maybe, uh, what were your thoughts about that? Uh, what my thoughts about what she said? Well, just, just 
that whole notion really. I guess it's more of an observation than a question, but I just thought it was cool how in sync you guys are. Um, to acknowledge that it's our responsibility to, to yeah. Well, like, how do you yeah. go about that? How do you how do you how do you go about mm. making your uh, your teammates fall in love with your work so that they so that they so that audio is not just a polished thing and it's mm -hmm. not a post production task. It's something that you know is integrated with it, the development of of the experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll I'll try to answer your question. Let me know if it's not what you're expecting. Sure, um, sure. <laughs> but um, it it's challenging, especially when there's no like audio department. In my situation, you know the the art has an art director, art lead, and a lot of three D artists and their whole team. And you know the programmers they have the programmer, the lead director. And the design has a director. And audio, we didn't have an audio department. It was just me. So people didn't really consider me as like one of the main branches of the game development. And I think um, to solve, like solving that, just the, you know, how people think of audio in terms of pipeline, that was really important. So. I had a lot of talk with uh, my manager who was the game director to make sure that audio is one of the main branches. And whenever we are brainstorming about features, I had to be included or we, even, even though I'm not there, the, they will just keep audio in mind when they're first brainstorming even. That was really, really important for me. And Right, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And, the mock-up videos that really helps because people just playing the wave file they don't really get it and especially for this kind of music it can sound boring because the music can le can last for like three to four minutes and it's really important just just to give them a full context with the gameplay capture and how you will hear it within the context i think that really helped uh, making them fall in love <laughs> does that answer your question Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, all right. All right. Yeah. Our uh, next question is uh, David. Uh, David, can you ask a question? Oh, is it me? Hi, oh, Shani. Uh, oh, um, it's, it's David Schneider, I believe. Okay. Yeah, I, it's, I didn't hear you before. Uh, hi. Just curious, is the is this game still under active development and are, are you still involved with it, or you, have you moved on to something else? So I moved on to the HoloLens team, um, and I think they're in a transition in terms of development, but it's still being developed, and it is going. <laughs> it is going, yeah. Are you working on something similar now? Or, or is it uh, I guess it's kind of similar. It's it's augmented like mixed reality things so i work with the other designers to create sound effects and music and implementation so in terms of just what what i do it's kind of similar but i would say it's not in games the stuff that i do right now cool yeah. thanks yeah all right uh if david buzz could go this time Sorry, I'm not sure. Sure thing. Sorry about that. Uh, so in your talk, you had mentioned that you were working with, uh, I guess, software devs and QA to let them know that there have been issues and bugs. And mm -hmm. as someone who works as a QA engineer with an audio software company, maybe a bit jealously, I'd be curious if you have any advice or just things that you would suggest for anyone who wants to understand a bit more about the audio and things to point out in here. I know a lot of it comes down to just use your ears and pay attention, but if there are other things that you can point out that would be helpful uh, that you'd want to pass on, I'd be appreciative. For non-audio people to chime into audio testing? Yeah. Sorry, we, trying to, yeah. yeah. For sure. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I think for a like very basic level, we want to make sure that the testers are even hearing the audio. A lot of times they don't realize that 
um, they, they just test with the speakers muted. So hmm. I think <laughs> even that level is missing a lot of the times. So uh, I think it's important to talk to the test team and make sure that the audio is already, um, the speakers are also, uh, sorry, always on. So if the sound bank is it's broken or something and the whole audio is missing. They have to realize that like right away so we can fix it. And um, let's see what else. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm like brainstorming right now. Um, I think it's just conversation with the test team and testers and whenever we have a feature that has to be tested, I always make sure that I leave a comment on the, the, the page that testers look at to test things. I make sure to list out what audio things to be tested. Like number one, it should be like this audio file should be heard in this context and it should be coming, it should be emitted from the actual position. And if there's like, um, DSP effects, like I list out everything so they can kind of ex know what to expect. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, that absolutely. That question? makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, this Thank is great. You. Uh, I don't other see questions? any other questions, but I actually did have a, a question myself. Um, yeah. you, you know, when you were talking about, um, you know, you, first found out it was an AR game and like, oh my goodness, I need to find out all about these <laughs> HDFs and all this fancy technology and, and all of that sort of, was there anything, was there any moment like specifically where you realized you needed to focus on, on the end product and, mm -hmm. and just like, was there any specific like, like story, I guess that you could talk about where you suddenly realized it doesn't necessarily have to be that complicated? Mm. Um, it was a quick realization. So when I was hired, they didn't tell me anything. They just that they just said new Minecraft game, <laughs> and, right. and when the director showed me a prototype of the game, he just you know played the build on his phone, and the Minecraft world was inside of your inside of your little screen. And I didn't really realize that it was AR. It was just like oh, it's a mobile game. Okay, and then I. And then I went home and figured out, oh, this is an AR. And I had a quick second, a second of just panicking. And um, and then I, I quickly realized that this is mobile AR. And I don't even think there's anything in the game engine to handle spatialization that well. And it's some... Uh, yeah, I, I thought it was just a quick realization for me. Just the platform itself, pr platform itself mo being a mobile game made me realize that I don't really have to worry about HRTF, any kind yeah. of things. And realizing like what technology that we can work with, it was like the specialization plugin was not something that I could think of. So I quickly just forgot about all the like all the worrying about the technology and focused on like what the gameplay is like. And then I made a list of things in audio that one needs to be done. <laughs> Am I answering your question? No, yeah, is absolutely. That, yeah? Um, I don't see any other hand raises, so I think we're going into coffee hour. Is that right? That's Yay. right. Yay, Shawnee. Thank you yeah. so much, everyone. Thank you so it's much, Shawnee, for a fantastic presentation. Um, as we just kind of highlighted there, we're going to go into a 27-minute break, and we will um, have some mingling and mixing time in the lobby. But we will also reconvene back here for the final session, um, which will be, as I said, in 27 minutes and on the UI uh, user experience and binaural audio. So two more fantastic presentations that we'll see you back here for. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>